Hello, everybody. It's Philip Lee returning with another episode of Civil War Chat. To be notified of future episodes, uh, click on the subscribe button below here and also the notification bell in the upper right. Today is the uh, 10th of June, 2021, and our topic is last days of Washington and Lee University, question mark. Specifics about the recent decision to preserve the name of Washington and Lee University are so corrupted with calumny against the two historical icons that the decision might be a deceptive tactic to avoid losing donations and legacy from aged alumni. After all, 40% of WNL's operating budget is provided by its endowment, mostly obtained from former graduates over a period of 150 years. First and foremost, critics of Washington and particularly Lee failed to appreciate that the school would likely not exist without their contributions. In its day, Washington's 1796 gift of James River Canal Company stock was one of the largest to any American educational institution. Later, when Lee arrived in 1865, the war ravaged school had but 40 students and four faculty. Upon his death, five years later, it had 400 students from many states and even a few foreign countries. The sweeping revisions of WNL's traditions suggested by some present administrators, faculty, and student should be dismissed by the, because, they, because the ungrateful can never be satisfied. Second, contrary to their claims, WNL's administration has rejected good faith conversations with respectful alumni opposing their censorious viewpoint. During the past year, they denied requests, that is, the administration denied requests by venerable graduates holding his history PhDs to make video responses in the same WNL sponsored online venue to uh, online speeches by historians biased against Lee. Moreover, the administration has not permitted anyone to provide a full throated defense of Lee in that same forum. Instead, it has merely allowed only a tiny minority of ostensible defenses from discussion panel members so diluted with the zeitgeist of identity politics as to be spineless and totally unprincipled. Third, renaming the 153-year-old Lee Chapel as the University Chapel and stripping it of Lee mementos is downright wicked. Completed in 1868, three years after Lee arrived, it was one of the first new structures he requested. Although he desired students to attend, he abolished compulsory chapel attendance two years before the new structure was finished. The decision on uh, compulsory attendance reflected his maxim, quote, you should not force young men to do their duty, but let them do it voluntarily and thereby develop their characters, close quote. Characteristically, therefore, he encouraged attendance by example, regularly sitting in the second pew by the north wall. That maxim and his lead by example conduct were foundational to the school's emerging student administered honor system. That's why freshmen traditionally took the honor code pledge in the Lee Chapel. Abandoning that tradition will weaken code compliance by breaking the connection to previous generations of students. Without that connection, they are like leaves without a branch. Nobody can tell where the wind, winds of the future will blow them. Lacking respect for the honor code, WNL will provide graduates capable of rationalizing any misconduct. Fourth, the, re the repudiation of uh, so-called Confederate nostalgia is a vague gesture that disparages the long line of ex-Confederate alumni and their descendants that never failed to support the school. Given their donations, WNL progressed to become one of the nation's largest respected liberal arts colleges. Condem condemnation of the donors ignores the wisdom of WNL Glasgow endowment lecturer and Texas novelist William Humphrey, who wrote concerning Civil War memory, it is with, quote, it is with kin, not causes that the Southerner is linked, close quote. In contrast, the board's repudiation of racism is both superfluous and contradictory. The number of white supremacists among alum, uh, WNL alumni could not fill a rowboat. The presently obvious racism, however, is a fantasy termed critical race theory, which imagines that America's accomplishments are wholly derived from the exploitation of blacks and other minorities. It's a stretch requiring a bungee cord. As late as 1940, half of the South sharecroppers were white, and they lived under economic conditions 
nearly as uh, is nearly identical to black croppers. The wagon wheel ruts of white settlers on the Oregon Trail are still discernible to anyone who cares to see them. Critical race theory is the racism of the age. It warrants unqualified and immediate repudiation at WNL. Finally, the removal of the Lee and Washington portraits from the WNL and diplomas is impudent. Our country would not exist without Washington. And to repeat, the school would likely have failed without Lee and his devotees. It is a virtue signaling tactic. This removal of their portraits is a virtue signaling tactic among those who wish to honor themselves by confessing to the shame of racism and slavery. And it is completely fake. Real shame, real shame is emotionally one of the most painful experiences anyone can have. It is soul destroying. And even the stuff of suicide, the, the actual experience of the Mia Culpas, Mia Culpas by virtue signaling whites is not one of shame. It is really the opposite of shame. It is display. It is preening. It is an act of separating themselves from supposedly unaware whites by embracing an ostensible shame. The self-flagellating whites are showing how superior they are compared to the rest of us. In their minds, each has transformed himself into a kind of honorary black person. Therefore, they reason, the guilt does not attach to them, but only to the other whites, meaning those of us who want to just, uh, retain the Washington and Lee tradition. It is, it is uh, despicable. In conclusion, there was a time when a lunatic fringe convinced a great majority of Americans to outlaw alcoholic beverages. It did not last. At another time, an ungrateful minority spread a madness that endorsed a practice of greeting our returning Vietnam veterans with this disdain. That also did not last. As playwright Ralph Inge has warned, whoever marries the spirit of this age will find himself a widower in the next. Uh, that's a quote from him. I'm going to go on now and uh, recommend that you get this book, The Confederacy with Flood Tide, if you're interested in learning more about Lee during the Civil War. This covers the period from June to December of 1862, when the Confederacy, and Confederacy came closest to winning its independence. If you'd like an autograph copy, you need to contact me. I will pay for the postage here in the United States. You can get this book at uh, Barnes & Noble or Amazon, any fine bookstore. Uh, the Confederacy at Flood Tide by Philip Lee. If you want the autograph copy, contact me via email, Phil, P-H-I-L, underscore, Lee, L-E-I-G-H, at me, M-E, dot com. And I will, the price, uh, the price at Barnes and & Noble and uh, Amazon will be $28.00. Uh, and don't cover that, you know, the, you'll work out the shipping with them. If you want the autographed copy from me, uh, that will be $31. And you can use PayPal, credit card, whatever. Anyway, just contact me via email. And uh, I want to thank you for watching. That's our show for today. And uh, have a good day.